My name is Dean Brooks, and I'm the director of the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies. And I wanted to start off uh, this afternoon session uh, with a thank you um, to UNU Wider, of course, for organizing this event and for bringing me here. Uh, this is very exciting to be a part of this. And, and also to Finnish Church Aid, who's provided a wonderful schedule allowing all of us here on the panel to visit Finnish schools and understand the context here in Finland and learn from that. Uh, so thank you to everyone. Um, and we have a very distinguished uh, group of uh, folks on the panel that I will introduce as they speak. So if you'll wait just a bit, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a longer introduction. Uh, but before we get into the panel discussion, I wanted to tell you just a bit about the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies. So if you'll actually look up here, you'll see that um, INEE uh, is a network of 12,000 members, more than that. Every day, three or four new people join. And all of you here in the room, if you're interested in education and emergencies, you are welcome to join. Um, it's a free, open network. All of our tools and resources are also free and downloadable in multiple languages. And we, are, we consist of academics like yourself, uh, the UN actually is our founding um, <clears throat> body, so UNESCO, UNICEF, UNHCR uh, are the founding agencies. <clears throat> and uh, our, our mission, our overarching um, goal is to promote access to quality, uh, safe and relevant education for all persons affected by crisis, which is really what this discussion today is all about. One thing I think is very important uh, to explain uh, when I'm describing uh, INEE is that we have very specific functions. And INEE's functions are not to build a school in CAR, for example, but actually to support our members who are building that school, supporting the ministry, for example, with good resources that would help them. Uh, so we have these six functions, which is about community building, about convening, knowledge management, amplifying and advocating for uh, good practice in the field, facilitating and learning, and providing. Uh, so we're uh, a global network where our team is scattered around the world. We have staff sitting in Geneva, Norway, Zimbabwe, Chile. I sit in New York, actually. But we're very small. That sounds like a lot of people, but it's actually about a team of 10 people. So we're a very lean uh, network at the same time. So what we actually are really working towards are these four points. Access to quality, relevant, and safe education. Integration of education into all humanitarian interventions sustainable funding and holistic policies. And then the last one um, is the minimum standards for education in emergencies, which is our foundational tool and resource for practitioners, for governments, policymakers, um, to ensure that the delivery of education um, is done so in a quality way. So today's um, discussion is really <clears throat> about this point on quality, and we're going to come back to it uh, throughout the day. And I wanted to just start off um, with uh, this point, that the right to education is most at risk in emergencies, <clears throat> but it's also the exact time when it's needed most. Conflict is a major barrier to education. Globally, we know that 63 million children and youth are out of school, living in conflict-affected areas. <clears throat> But the other thing that we know is that communities, parents, children prioritize education. And we know this again and again. Uh, earlier I was talking with colleagues. Every emergency that I've been a part of responding to, you always find the community has started the schools before you get there. Or they've organized the students um, in you know, spaces under the trees. And then the NGOs and the humanitarian actors come and we build on that work. But it has always been a priority. And globally, we're seeing more and more emphasis on that. Even though it is a priority, um, 
The sad fact is that education is underfunded when it comes to humanitarian funding. Only globally 2% of humanitarian funding is for education and emergencies. So yes, we need political commitment. Yes, we're starting to see more of that. But at the same time, it's not fast enough. It's not happening fast enough. So I would say today's session, this panel is really going to be looking at at this need uh, to join up for governments and the humanitarian development actors to come together, uh, to collaborate more, um, to discuss solutions. Uh, and I would say that the experts on this panel um, are the ones to be talking to us about that. So I'm very happy they're here. And um, we're also going to try to focus on innovation. So how can innovation actually support uh, response? Um, so at this time, we're actually going to show you a little video. And uh, this is uh, created by Finnish Church Aid. And uh, I will just let the video get started. Have you ever wondered what happens to a child who doesn't have access to education? We all know children who don't have access to education are at great risk of harsher destinies. Not only are they lacking in maturing cognitive skills, but they run the risk of being abducted, trafficked, forced to work for armed groups, and even forced into early marriage. Everybody has the right to education. However, in 2016, 263 million children and youth are out of school, an equivalent to a quarter of the population of Europe. The number includes not only dropouts of primary and secondary school, but those who are left out of upper secondary school. Crises and conflicts are a major barrier to accessing education. Being out of school is often a reality for refugees, even in Europe. For example, in May 2016, 100% of refugee children in Greece had no access to school. Globally, 63 million out-of-school children and youth live in conflict-affected areas. FCA is dedicated to improving the quality of education in emergencies. We work in fragile contexts and increasingly relate to people on the move. Our solution is to offer innovations in order to guarantee quality education. FCA's flagship invention is the global Teachers Without Borders network and its education specialists, who are deployed to support the professional development of teachers in developing countries. We also support education sector development, particularly in emergency and fragile contexts. And we are known to provide effective access to inclusive, learner-friendly and safe learning environments. As we put people's resilience, their well-being, and the fulfillment of their rights at the centre of our work, psychosocial well-being of children and youth is improved through recreational activities and sports. FCA also aims to find practical ways of ensuring the accessibility and quality of vocational education. We link vocational education to the job market to facilitate employment. Take, for example, Uganda a country with one of the youngest populations. Where one in two Ugandans are under the age of 15 years, 75% are under the age of 30. However, only 2% get vocational education. FCA's vocational school in the refugee settlement of Rwanda in Western Uganda is the only vocational school within a radius of 150 kilometers. Yes, good. Mana yakusoma ni kwa sababu maisha ya kesho ambayo itakuja tupate gisi tutalea watoto ambao tutazaa na kuchunga family zetu vizuri nikakuwa na elimu itanisaidia mu maisha hata kama niko na soma paka niko na elimu nini naweza pata kazi sana mali sana saidia jamaa yangu the innovative solutions lie in the heart of FCA's work our unique education programs aim to empower the students and open their eyes to opportunities they never thought were possible through entrepreneur and job readiness education. 
The aim is to improve entrepreneurial thinking through practical work and provide support for students in creating business ideas. <laughs> this far, education in emergencies has not been a political priority. But when you ask refugee children, youth and their families, their biggest hope and motivation for looking for a better tomorrow is quality education. Education is a human right and yet receives less than 2% of all humanitarian funding. We need to continue to inspire political commitment as supporting education is an effective way of constructing a more sustainable future for both nations and their children and youth. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a pilot, doctor, nurse. I want to be a football player. I think that video does a nice job of uh, introducing us uh, today's, to today's discussion. Um, one, one final thing I'd like to say before we start was this morning when Elizabeth Wren um, mentioned the Democratic Republic of Congo <clears throat> in the first session, and she said that she uh, was told, whatever you do, please provide education. So I think uh, this ties in very much uh, to that statement earlier today. Mm -hmm.